Arthur. She is the executive director of the South Florida Theater League. Um, she's a playwright, and she is the Southern rep. Is that the title? South East Florida. Florida. Florida is specific. I'm not because there's land is the for the next for the store. But so, um, but Florida in general for the drama skill. <laughs> for the drama skill. I'll turn it over to you, Andy. All right. Um, and then this panel is on production and self-production. We have a really interesting panel. Um, I'm going to introduce them all, but I also want them to talk a little bit about their sort of stake in what this process is, because I think if it's coming from them, it's much more exciting, because I don't have their experiences. Um, Roland is the membership court director, sorry, membership director for the Drama Guild, and he does what they call self-production boot camp um, for Drama Guild members to sort of get the idea of let's go out and produce on ourselves, so he's on the self-production side. Um, as, a, as a player who's produced, uh, produced so work. Um, Joan is, Joan Stein is a commercial producer. She produced uh, the Standing on Ceremony, um, and it's gonna be at City Right, that's right, at City Theater. It's gonna be at the Broward Center for Performing Arts. It's gone around uh, Standing on Ceremony. It's about gay marriage plays, and it's really exciting, and I'm looking forward to seeing it next week. Christian Parker is the artistic director of the Atlantic Theater Company. And associate of oh. <laughs> <laughs> This is bad when you have paper in front of you. You read the bios. You read the bios. But coming from that sort of nonprofit theater side, it wants like the production on that end of the spectrum. And then Rachel is also with the Drama Skill. She's with the Drama Skill Fund, which that hands out grant money, so we got friends. Um, and I just sort of want you all to sort of speak from that sort of like on, on not just do a better introduction than I am, but sort of where you feel you are and what your role as a producer is in the process to start off with. Um, well, maybe I'll talk about the self-production sort of thing that's been happening with the Guild over the past four or five years. Slowly, over time, more and more, uh, members of the Dramatists Guild have been curious, interested, uh, n less and less shy to say that maybe they might want to produce their own work. And so in response, we've created things, um, different kinds of offerings. We've done panels on producing and we've done um, this self-production boot camp, which is basically just a day-long kind of uh, get your feet wet in what the nuts and bolts are of producing. But I would say that the number, the first thing that I always say um, to people when they're taking the boot camp is, you, the most important thing, thing that you can do for yourself um, before you start any of this is to accept that one thing is true. There is one thing that is true about you and your work, and it is never going to change. And that is that because you wrote it, there is never going to be another person on the planet who is as passionate or as emotional, emotionally connected to that baby as you are. And once you accept that as just being the reality, then you can begin to free yourself up to be able to gather a team together to help work on nurturing this baby and bringing it to life. But if you if you fight against that, if you don't accept that that's the reality, you can cause you can cause yourself a lot of har unnecessary heartache. Does that make sense? Um, I have been uh, producing for thirty years. I've uh, worked in not-for-profit theater. Uh, most of my career has been in the commercial theater, as an independent producer, and in writing theaters. Um, and. I love the writers. I always give it up for the writers. So my relationship, and, and I have been lucky enough to have worked with spectacular writers over the years, producing James Pine's first play, early plays by Jack Henley, Pete Gurney, um, plays by Warren Wright, Warren Light, Paul Rudnick, um, the most important thing for me uh, in a relationship with a playwright is listening to one another. I've also worked in television where the writer's role is uh, different from the writer's role in the theater. And in television, 
any film, the writer's work is taken, it's changed, it's rewritten. The writer's voice is not as um, treasured as, uh, as it is in the theater. So hearing each other, listening to each other, really being honest with one another is important. And for writers, I mean, I, I unfortunately don't have the talent to be a writer, but it's important that writers know that they have their own power. And that if somebody says to change that, that's not really enough of a reason to change something. However, if you can find the right partners in your work, either in not-for-profit theater or commercial theater or with an agent or with a manager or an actor who is a musician, you can get into a dialogue and really listen and be willing to hear and answer the hard questions of, well, what's really supposed to happen here? And why, well, I'm confused. I, I don't understand that. Um, I think it is the beginning of a fantastic relationship that can really enrich um, you know, a playwright's experience and, uh, and ultimately lead to more of what the playwright wants, uh, wants to deliver. I agree with John. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I work on the not for profit side at the Atlantic Theater Company and I've worked at for quite a while and uh, I've also worked at the Theater Club, so different, slightly different. Well, more than slightly different, not, not for profits, but in the same sort of mainstream sphere. Um, but I also teach um, at Columbia in the graduate theater program. And uh, the first thing, one of the main things that I communicate to all my students, I run the uh, program for dramaturgy, but I also teach playwrights and I teach directors and theater management, and managers and producers. And, um, the first thing that I say to them, or, or one of the first things that I often say to them is, is nobody made you do this. So remember that. <laughs> All the time. I mean, every day, several times a day. Because um, I, the theater is hard enough to, to make a mark in that, that I think people act out of a sense of desperation very often. And through the of what both of them were saying about sort of knowing what you have and who you are and what you are intellectual and emotional orientation is to your work, you need to position yourself um, to sort of step out into the world um, with a sense of who you are and what that is, what, the, what, you, what you think the value of your work is, and where it should go. Uh, you know, I, I, so I, I'm counseling students a lot to sort of about their careers and where they're going to get work, whether it's as playwrights or anything else. And, um, and then uh, the theater side of it, you know, interacting with playwrights all the time who want us to their work and um, and I think that the happiest artists that I know and that even the young artists who are coming out of school and feeling very panicky about what's going to happen next, those that are that are most content are those that are doing their homework very very actively about what what the landscape is, where the opportunities might be, and being very rigorous about sort of self critique about their own work and where it might best live. Uh, aligning themselves with specific theaters uh, to submit their work to, uh, or specific individuals that they've met along the way that they think might have a sympathetic ear or eye, um, so that they don't just feel like they're kind of throwing their work up into the air and waiting for somebody to grab it. The, the, in fact, that's not going to really work. And I, and I, I, I think those people, not that they don't face frustration, but the, if, if they're able to orient themselves to sort of proactive approach, whether it amounts to ultimately self-producing or whether it amounts to um, a more clear-eyed relationship with potential producers because you can speak coherently about what you're doing and why it aligns with what at least you perceive that that organization or that commercial producer has already taken an interest in before, um, that's a very good place to start the conversation. I love a cover letter that reads like, you know, I've been coming to see Plague of the Atlantic for years, and I saw this, and this, and this, and my work, I think, fits into your, your sort of general, the general parameters of your production history in this way. Um, would you be willing to take a look? And really, in the same way that writing a cover letter to any organization, no matter what field you're in, it 
must include some knowledge of what that place does. Um, I think artists often forget that that's important in the theater. So I, and I think, so I, I try to exhort my students to kind of take charge of their, um, their careers in that way. Um, so that's where it starts. I want a cover letter that's supposed to compliment me. Well, <laughs>
the, the national landscape up here has changed dramatically in the past few decades, where uh, obviously not-for-profit theaters have taken such a major position now in nurturing writers and uh, presenting new work and all sorts of partnerships and collaborations are going on now between commercial productions and not-for-profit productions and um, uh, so you can't afford just to get stuck in your own head and in your own place of, okay, I'm writing this play, and I need to get this play done, because I need to get it done for my brand. You kind of really put yourself out in the world so that when somebody says to you, well, it may not be right here, instead of becoming anxious or defensive or worried about it, you have the wherewithal to say, well, where do you think it might fit? And you have the knowledge when they say, well, there's, you know, this, are you aware of the city <coughs> rep theater where Dick Kale happens to originate a lot of work? So yeah, I, I do know about that theater. Um, there are all sorts of business reports, Thomas Cott, uh, formerly of Lincoln uh, Center. It's that great, the Cott from the Lincoln Center. I love it. You've Cott from the Right? Yeah. It's fantastic. And, I think it's every day. Yeah, yeah every, every day, yeah. something new. Yeah. And it's so informative about the business or the creative end or, or problems or struggles or solutions. And you know, sitting by yourself in you know East Nowheresville and you're part of a conversation, part of a world, I just cannot impress upon everybody enough how important it is to be knowledgeable, not just about what you do, but about what everybody else does in and, your community. And don't you think it's also about going to theater? Oh, I mean, I'm amazed how many times I get phone calls from people obsessed with their play, and then I start asking them about wherever they live and the theaters in their neck of the woods, and they never go and see any theater. Right. How can you be writing theater yeah. and not be interested or curious to go see theater? I mean, I also think there's a, a degree of honesty, and I, again, this applies to, to pretty much everyone in the business, actually, who sees the need to get ahead in some way, I suppose, but, but especially for writers, that there's a, um, an honesty about why you want to have your play produced and, and for whom. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we tend to generalize about, like, well, of course, you wrote it, so you want to see it produced, but that's not as, that's not, it's not as simple as that. You know, what, who, did you write it with an audience in mind? Is there a particular demographic in the world that you feel like you will speak to? Is there a particular demographic that you are unfamiliar with that you think it might resonate with, but that you don't know? You know, is there a type? Is there a size theater that you feel like it belongs in? Is there a certain amount of money that you feel that you should be paid in order to have that show on? Is your only, is your singular dream Broadway or nothing? You know, what are, what, what are the parameters around which you feel that, that a production of that play could allow you to feel success with that production? It might be in a basement somewhere with a bunch of your friends, which you self-produced for next to nothing, and had a happily satisfactory run, and got one review or no reviews, and then you move on to the next thing. That might be. But if that's not, and you end up choosing that, that's a highway to unhappiness. <laughs> you know, so what, what are the parameters around which you could be happy? With the production, uh, because uh, otherwise you're you're going to have a harder time having a transparent conversation with potential collaborators or potential producers or angels who are going to help pay for it. You know. You know, one of the things I'm, I'm very traditionally trained, so I am always wanting to know well, what is this play about, and it's not about you know two guys walk into a bar. I I almost don't care about the plot. I really want a writer to be able to articulate to me the thematic bones of a play or a musical and to be able to say it clearly and passionately so that I become engaged. Now, maybe it's a subject matter that I'm not interested in, and that's fine, because then there'll be another producer who is interested. But um, the the most interesting thing for me is when a writer says, um, this play is about, and can really speak to that in a way that I understand why he or she has
had to write that play, and why that was important. And then you build your community of characters and your of your arts and your plots and you know, all of these structural components uh, of a play. But essentially, if you can't tell me what it's about, I am not going to be engaged. I also think that that goes to who, how you choose the people that you will listen to the most mm -hmm. who are, who are going to give you feedback on plays. Because, um, I mean, if you're self-producing, you might have a the luxury of not really getting too much feedback from anybody well, except hopefully the director. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. But but if not, if you're actually trying to work within an institutional model and you're not writing for a company as you go, you're not doing devised work or whatever, you're gonna have people who intersect with your work who want to give you feedback, most of which are not necessarily gonna have particularly astute insights into your work or might not be good communicators. I mean, there's lots of people out there in a position to give feedback we don't do it very well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but how you choose to, um, uh, how, how, you, how you attune yourself to, to hearing what resonates with you will, will, have, will somewhat be defined by how well you can define things like, well, what's it about? I often think, um, you know, at the end of the day also, uh, Producers, whether they be commercial producers or not-for-profit producer, producers, um, gravitate to and commit to work that speaks to them personally um, or, read, or sparks some intellectual interest in them, uh, regardless, generally speaking, of whatever dramaturgical problems might be in the play. It's a rare case where you'll find a play where you say, like, well, we will, we do want to produce this, but we really need you to do X, Y, and Z to clean it up before we say that. Like, basically, if, if you love a play, if you, if you love it enough to, to, to really feel that strongly about it, those other concerns tend to fall aside. So there's a, I would, I would say that there, I would caution writers against sort of being strung along by organizations or sort of saying, well, if you do X, then probably Y. Uh -huh. um, because that, that's usually coming from somebody within the organization who's trying to position the play for success. And sometimes that might work, but, but generally speaking, that's a, hot, that's a, it's a slow road to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as opposed to, because when artistic directors really respond to something, all of those dramaturgical concerns go out the window, generally. And then, once they've committed, you have to start to have the conversation. It's not to say that they never bother you again, or that you never get help, have your hand held to the fire in order to improve upon what you have. But, but doing all that work ahead of time to get to the yes is, is a really not so good idea. So if you're starting to get those messages, I think it's really important to lead the conversation towards What's going on here? What do you actually want from me? Is this a situation where you like this but the artistic director hasn't read it yet? Is this a situation where you want it to be something other than it is? Like, how much do you really love this play? Um, and I think you have to have the confidence to walk away from that situation in order to have that conversation. But um, it is incumbent, anyway, all that said, uh, on writers, I think, to walk into those conversations with open eyes and be able to speak cogently about where you are in your process with play and what it is about. Um, and, and if you're like me and you have great difficulty articulating what your play is about, because I really struggle with that a lot, yeah. I can tell you a great trick is when you gather your actor friends in your living room and you make lasagna for them and they read the play for the very first time and they, and they get to the last page, they close the script, just ask them. Actors know. Ask them, what do you think this play is about? And take notes. It's a yeah. great way to, to, to get a, a mirror on your own work. Because <coughs> sometimes when you're so in it, it's very hard to, to be able to. Uh, along those lines, something I heard to answer Joan's question where what it's about is what the story of the play. Actually really think about what the play is about and separate that. Like mm. do a one sentence, this is the story of the play, do a one sentence, this is what the play is about, and not try to match the two. It, it's, I think it's very challenging. I mean, I don't, I'm not being glib when I say, you know, you have to be able to articulate what it's about. I think that um, it's completely possible to 
write a play with uh, intelligence and talent and, and passion and get really stuck on being able to identify the bones of the theme of it that rises above the action. But it's usually part of the rewriting process mm -hmm. is that there's a turning point when it crystallizes for you mm -hmm. and then it's kind of done, you know? Like if you, when you really understand yeah. what it is, really. That's kind of thrilling. Well, and, you know, sometimes, and there can be really interesting conversations that lead from a writer talking about what is, because I, 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 would, I would, another way to phrase <clears throat> that same question is, well, what's most interesting to you about what you've written? You know, where, where are you, what are you most obsessed with in this piece? And that might be, you might go right to a perceived flaw in the play, or you might go right to the reason you wrote the play in answer to that question, and what sort of strain of the story, or what um, sub, sub storyline is the most important. But um, <coughs> that's a great test of what kind of collaboration you might have with a potential producer, also. Because of having the conversation about well, what they perceived, what they gravitated to in the play, as opposed to if that differs from what you. you hoped it would be, you know, what you gravitate to in the play, is an interesting stepping off point. That, to me, that doesn't mean that you won't, if you don't agree, that doesn't mean you won't have an interesting collaboration. It might mean that you're actually really well matched to kind of find, find your way forward into something that's clearer and better. Um, or you might just have an instant agreement about something and then, you know, get the offer that day because that will inspire the confidence in the producer to say like, oh, we see this the same way. I get it. That person's really going for something here. They might be able to deepen it or clarify it, but 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 um, I, I can have the confidence to move forward. With something like that, so. You talked a little bit about knowing the audience, specifically if you know the art, the theater. Um, I know before we had the actual downtown, we had the discussion of playwrights just sending stuff indiscriminately. We yeah. talked about that a little bit and how that. How do you think? Since playwrights are so, we tend to be. And I speak as one. We tend to be like, oh, this is. Yeah. How do you get people more outward thinking about who is the right, because I know right audience for their plays, because I know playwrights will say, oh, well, everyone should show up to yeah. play, and that's... <laughs> or they answer, they answer, I don't know, I wrote it, for, I'm the audience for my play, right? right. That's, that's, often, that's often a response, yeah. too. Like, I wrote it for myself. Um, and I think the key is, I, I really think it goes back to the, the question I raised at the beginning, like, no one made you do this. Why did you want to write for this form? Oh, yeah, you know, like why? Why did you decide that this, that the work that you put on the page, on a page, should interact with an audience? It's not about like who are the people. Like it's you know, white women aged twenty five <laughs> to thirty nine who are gonna respond to my play. Like you don't have to know that because that's limiting anyway. I mean, but but who, when, like what, in what cultural context? What? What kind of venue? Like, you have to go to the theater, see architecture, see what. How did you conceive how this would work in space? How how do you perceive that the style that you're writing in, or the content that you're writing, is gonna be received? You know, uh, how provocative is it? I guess, or how um, in a in a particular cultural context, what's provocative in Miami might not be provocative somewhere else, or it might be more provocative than than somewhere else. And uh, so. That, those are the kinds of questions that are really leads to the answer that I was sort of asking right. for, which is it's not about who exactly, it's about who and where and what kinds of theaters. And do you fantasize about, you know, what, who are the people that, what, if you know what you're going for, you might be able to project forward to think about what social value you think the work has or what, or what aesthetic value it has to challenge people's suppositions about how the theater can work at all. Or, you know, I, I don't know. I think, those are the kind of things. Like why do you do that? Why do you write in this form? Because if it's only about you as an audience, I would question why the theater is an interest. Mm -hmm. And you can get creative with that too. I worked with um, Brian Laudermilk and Kate Kerrigan, and this was before Goodspeed did unauthorized autobiography of Samantha Brown, but they, they ran a Kickstarter campaign to fund their new album. And the Kickstarter supporters were 18 to 35 year old females primarily. And so they ended up doing um, a tour called You Made This Tour where they went to different music venues where that demographic hung out in New York to really connect with their audience and share their work with them. And they had 
the luxury of being a composer or lyricist, so they could do that. It's a little more difficult with the play. Um, but they had a great connection with their audience that way, and then connecting with their national audience via Facebook and Ustream and all of that. So there's creative ways that you can connect before an actual production as well. Just any more insight on educating yourself? Because I know that's the thing we come to a lot, which is in fact with them with the audience, but just being, I know we talked about you caught mail. Um, there's the there's some resources on the internet that I know, but just sort of ways that playwrights can be more involved um, as opposed to just sort of cutting off or I'm just going to hand you the script. Like, how can it be more of an ongoing conversation? Well, you know, there, there are also um, uh, festivals around the country that, I mean, I, I think that they're really, really informative from um, Williamstown to the Berkshire Theatre Festival. Um, to uh, the O'Neill, to uh, Palo Alto, as a you know a, a, a wonderful playwriting festival, the OPI Playwrights Conference, um, New York Music Festival, <coughs> and, I, and I think after, this is where the new work is being developed, and everything is percolating, and it's fantastic to go and meet people and start not so much networking in a business sense, but connecting in a, in a professional sense, in a creative sense. So you start to build a community of people who you can turn to. I mean, I, I have people who I go to all the time. I have about five or six gurus. And um, when I have big business decisions coming up, whatever, I consult with people. I don't sit by myself and say, well, now, I have all this experience, what shall I do? <laughs> I really depend on hearing from trusted colleagues. Um, and I think the same is true in educating yourself about the community in which we live, the national community, the international community, what's important, and who is interested in creating the kind of work that you are interested in. You know, you're not gonna go to the, um, making this up, you know, the American Revival Theater, when you have a new, hot political play. Because that's not going to fit. And then you'll be rejected, not because the play isn't good, but because it's not the right place. I mean, I'm, I'm working on a play now, and um, had a theater company in New York offer me a space, fantastic theater company, but it's the wrong space for the show. Physically, it's the wrong space for the show. We can't accomplish what we need. It's not that it's a huge play, but it's not going to fit in the space. And the reason I know that is because I've been to see many shows there. Not because I've seen pictures. I've, I've experienced plays in there. And I know the difference between a play that works there and a play that doesn't. So I'm not going to waste this theater's time by saying, well, what would our deal be? And how would that, you know, because I'm interested in a continuing relationship, not in just a quick placement. So, and part of my job is taking care of the play and making sure that where it lands is the right space. And since I've already made that mistake, you know, as I move forward, I try to make new mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> and not be born to repeat the same place. Uh, but, you know, getting to what you said about sort of having a community of colleagues that you trust, I mean, I think uh, Chris Durang was talking earlier about how, you know, in his early, early career, it was about this collection of actors doing these shows and on a small scale. And, and there's, uh, there's something wonderful about if you have actors that you trust, that, that, that you can come to again and again and again, that's a great place to start. It's a safe place to start, right? Because actors love to do new work, and they love, and, and if you have a kinship, you can, that can be a wonderful way to begin that kind of, because it's hard, it's hard to, to get out of your apartment and go into the world, you know? <laughs> okay, I see a question in the back since I've just looked up. Ken? Um, Part of the title of this is self-publishing, uh, self-producing, which you have not touched on at all. 
but or hard to touch on. It's a hard to, I, I, yes, it's hard to fit all this into a 50 minute panel, and I apologize for that. So, but I've got a question for someone who's not on the panel. Okay. There's a huge prejudice, really, against self publishing in terms of novels or short stories or that sort of thing. So we have someone here from Samuel French, and they, for instance, like to see it a show have one or two productions in good theaters with a set of reviews before they would consider it. I wonder if they have a prejudice against self-producing or what their um, standard would be on here? your self-producing play. I don't know. I do know it's... Um, yeah. In general, I do know that um, it's a little bit easier if you're going to do self-production. There's a lot of small theater companies that are uh, cropped up down here because actors wanted to create the cast, let, let and they get reviewed. So I'll just say one simple thing: that, that just you know, a, a script in your drawer ha, uh, is is uh, has less of a chance of somebody being interested <laughs> in it than a script that's actually up on its feet, where people can see it and experience it live. I mean, you know, and, and no matter how many times people say, you know, and I know we have this obsession for virgin scripts, everybody wants it to be, the, you know, never having been touched or whatever, but that's all fudgeable. <laughs> 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 I'd like to speak to that about self-producing. Um, in the 1980s, when uh, I was producing my first play, Table Settings by James Lapine, and uh, quit my job as a press agent to wait on table so that I could uh, produce this play. Um, and I was a complete knucklehead, really. I didn't know anything except that I had this passion for it. Um, I was working at a restaurant in uh, Lower Manhattan on the east side called Key Size. And um, on St. Mark's Place, there was a club called Club 57. And there were these two young guys who completely unknown goofballs named Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman, who were producing their own work in this um, you know, underground <coughs> club that you know, we would leave work at the restaurant and pay five bucks to get into. And the first one was uh, Living Dolls. And they knew what they wanted to say, and they did not wait for somebody to give them the permission to have their work produced. And today, they're Mark Shaman and Scott Whitney. And, you know, sort of determining what they want to do. And most recently, Scott just went back to La Mama and produced a play up and directed it by Jackie Curtis, which is not at all commercial, but really interesting. Oh, but, he, but you know, so waiting for somebody else to say to you, okay, you can do this, is not necessarily you know, the game plan for everybody. And if you have something that you want to do, you can always do something for a lot of money, you can do something for very little money. But if you have the belief in it, and if you have the passion <coughs> about it, I really urge you to put it out there. Don't wait for anybody to say, okay, we approve. You've got to, you know, just take it by the horns and do it. And I'm sorry I'm interrupting you, but uh, there's 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 lots of playwrights who are named playwrights who self-produce. Uh, 13P is a great example of 13 playwrights who came together to self-produce, and Sarah Rule's one of them. So it's not, I don't think it's the same stigma that you get in self-publishing. And also, what is producing? Producing is gathering people together for a shared mission, right? And uh, don't kid yourself, Tony Kushner is a producer of his own work. I mean, he may not get a producer credit, but he is a force of nature that gathers people to do his work. And Tony, sorry, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right? Oh, no, I was just going to say that. Okay. Yeah. I was under the impression that if you were seeking a producer, the normal, um, course of events is to have a reading, have a, 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 a play, produce a, a showing of the play, tape it, and then show that tape to a producer. Is that, that for a professional, I'm sorry, for a commercial production is what you're asking about? If, if, if I were seeking a producer for my, my play, 
I was told that the normal progression is to first have a reading, then have a performance, take the performance, and show the producer the tape of the performance. No, never. No. Never. No. Can you set me straight on that, please? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, it should be normal. I don't yeah, know if there is a normal, because well, it's hard to show. What, what is the crowd I should be looking at? I mean, I think, it, it's what, what I was saying, I think mm -hmm. you should know what theaters you think your play would align with best and why, and approach those theaters with a, a, an intelligent cover letter about that very and thing. And a script. And a script. And that's it. That's it. Nothing, nothing no. to say. No, no. Yeah. The, because any, any producing theater is going to create, they want to create their own original production of your work. They don't want to see the, the mediated experience of watching a bad videotape of, you know, and, and places, we all know, places look terrible on tape. Yeah, so yeah. Mm -hmm. so that, that would be like the opposite of what you should ever do. And sometimes yeah. like, there, there are people who are endorsing you or endorsing your work. I think that that's a good thing yeah. to include in a letter. Um, but most theaters also have play reading programs. And if there's something really intriguing about your letter, you might get somebody to read your play. And if it's not ready for production, then maybe it's ready for reading. And you know, it just starts the process. And going back to relationships that we talked about before, if you have the relationship with someone who can then present your script to a, pro a commercial producer or a theater, that also gets you. you know, Having somebody else to introduce your yes. work to the theater, whether or not the agent, if it's just a friend you know who has a vested interest in your work, who knows someone in the theater, that will go further than your sending of, yeah, you know, line letter, for sure. Okay, I think we need to wrap up, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Um, but Andy, can we take this one question from this young lady right here? Okay. Katya? Hi. Hi, good morning. Um, very briefly, somebody said something about device projects, and that's something that I really want to work on. So, um, do you, what, like, what places, what resources, would you recommend, not necessarily in Miami, but in general, for somebody who wants to go into device? Wants to, yeah, well that's where that's where self-producing is going to be really key, actually, because yeah. you can't, if you're, if you're generating the text with collaborators in the room, you're going to want to put yourself in a position where you can do that. It's a little hard to just sort of do it in the hypothetical sense. <laughs> um, so I would, I would find the director that you like now, and then start to talk about how you would create something together in a room. Um, there are, Devised work, you know, that is created by a company or you know, with a director and a writer and with actors and designers in a room is certainly on the rise. Um, it is no longer just on the margins of, of what of the kind of new work that's being produced recently. And so, if it's an interest of yours, I, would, I mean, I don't want to go on a laundry list now because we have time, but I would look to the places that have been embracing it um, and find out what the sort of path to production was for those pieces. It's, Usually much longer, um, but I would start by finding yourself the director that you that you want to work with, who would have a sense of how to do that in a room. Um, yeah. Thank you all so much.